Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and Visa. And I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos like he is each and every episode. And Michael, we'll get into some of the combine notes and all the fun stuff a little bit later on. But we have to start the podcast on a more serious note here. Obviously, the news coming out yesterday morning about Jalen Carter, the Georgia defensive lineman, one of the top prospects in this year's draft. Now, he has returned to Indianapolis to finish out the measurements and all the interviews of the combine, but Carter was uh, an arrest warrant was put out for Jalen Carter for the reckless driving and racing in connection of the fatal crash involving a Georgia recruiting staff member and also a former Georgia Bulldog teammate on January 15th. Now, Carter was able to post a $4,000 bond, and he has been able to get out of jail. He was booked into jail at 1133 Eastern time last night, was released at 1149 Eastern time after posting that $4,000 bond here. But that is the big topic at hand here at the combine. And we'll get into all the layers of it because there are a lot of them to get into. But, Michael, this is something that I think with a lot of teams, I think now everyone's in kind of trying to in- investigate what really went down there that night, January 15th. Well, I think if you really were doing your homework, most of the teams kind of knew that there was somebody else involved in this. So I, I don't know if this kind of caught people by surprise. I really don't. In in thinking that, you know, there was something else. I mean, this is an ongoing investigation. So anytime you have that, you know, your sources on the ground at Georgia, you know, like I've often said, the, no matter, you can't go to the football office any longer to get information on players you got to go to the security office you got you got to go to the on-campus police you're going to have to find out other ways to see what's going on and carter will get all the details will come out and until those details come out i don't think there's going to be any decision of his draft viability I mean, obviously, people are going to move them up and down the board based on rumors and what they hear in the paper or what they read. But I think until the teams get their hand on it, you will find out that I think you got to you can't make a decision until you know all the information. Carter was charged with two misdemeanors yesterday morning. Athens Clark Police Department, the investigation that they found was that Carter was allegedly racing Georgia recruiting staffer Chandler LaCroix, who had fellow Georgia offensive lineman Devin Willick. In the car with them, LaCroix, 24 years old, Willick, 20 years old, died in that crash January 15th, which was initially reported as a single car accident there. The police say that LaCroix's vehicle was going around 104 miles per hour before the crash. And the toxicology reports had that the blood alcohol concentration for LaCroix was more than double the legal limit at 0.197. So obviously a sad situation, a tragic situation. Kirby Smart talked about it um, earlier this week about how they're still coping and grieving in this because this was during a time where they were celebrating a back-to-back national title. The parade, I believe, was earlier that day. They were all out later into the night and into the early morning on January 15th. And it's unfortunate that this happened. And Carter, now who NFL teams are trying to learn more about, if there's any sort of concerns there with him, now have this on top of, uh, of of the top of the scouting report when it comes to one of the best prospects in this upcoming draft. You know, and I read his comments. I read Kirby's comments. And I think, you know, look, this is going to be a full investigation. And as he said, all the facts will come out. He's cooperating. He's not running from it. And I think they're handling it the right way. I mean, obviously, it's a tragic event. I mean, they're handling it in the right manner, unlike what Alabama has done with Nate Oates. I mean, that has been just one disaster after another in terms of how you handle crisis management. We wrote about this for the Daily Coach and about Mm -hmm. how you as a leader have to take over. And obviously, Nate Oates hasn't done that, you know, saying he's drawing plays and he didn't see what happened. And then all of a sudden he says, oh, by the way, we do that before every game. I'm confused. What do you do? Like somebody died. Like, what are we doing here, Nate? And and how are you handling and leading the program? And I think that's ultimately what Kirby's trying to do here in contrast to what's going on. Both have tragic events that happened to them. Both we can't lose sight of. And we also need to understand how we react to those events is most important. So you mentioned Carter's statement. And toward the end of his statement, I'm not going to read the full thing. It's on his Twitter account at Breadman Jalen, if you want to go ahead and read the full thing here. But the final sentence says this, there is no question in my mind that when all of the facts are known, that I will be fully exonerated of any criminal wrongdoing. So this comes, though, after also, uh, in addition to some of the reports, 
that Carter was cited by that same police department, the Athens Clark County Police Department, on September 22nd of 2022, so September of last year in the fall, for speeding clocked at 89 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone here. Uh, when you see that, and then almost you see the alleged report about him maybe speeding or racing allegedly with Chandler LaCroix and his fellow offensive lineman teammate uh, Devin Willock in the car as well. I don't know if this is a situation where this is a young man who's just been a little bit reckless. I mean, we've all been young before. We've all been young men. We've all made stupid decisions. I'm not here to cast any aspersions or to judge the guy uh, because we don't know all the facts here just as of now. But do teams now start to get concerned with, okay, is he making the right decisions with the people that he has around him? Well, I mean, look, everything that you do as a collegiate player, past performance predicts future achievement. So every decision that you make impacts your life. And, you know, you have to be careful. You have to think things through. And as you get older and people are you're responsible for a lot of people in your life, you've got to think it through. You know, you no longer can just do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. So I, I think ultimately they're two separate instances. I think you got to keep them at that. You can't marry them together and just assume that, okay, he just drives fast all the time because that can be corrected. You know, that can be corrected. Now, behavior can't sometimes can't be corrected. Sometimes reckless behavior, you need to fix that. So I think to me, the best course of action is to make sure that you don't get into a situation where you start to judge this based on parcels of information that come out. And I think when you do that, I think what we wrote about in the Daily Coach this week that relates to a lot of this is what we call preference preference bias. And so what that means is, is because the social media is so interactive into, into formulating these mock drafts. I wrote about it, and the mock draft age started in 1958 in Long Beach, California, when Bob Kelly, the voice of the Rams, put, put the Rams draft into a mock draft. And that phenomena took off. And then the two brothers from Philadelphia, the Caruso brothers, they they started their own draft service. And then this Jerry Jones, no relation to Jerry Jones, the owner of the Cowboys, he then came up with the drugstore list. And and out of all this became the draft mock craze, right? And the draft net craze. And so what this bias tells us is when we react to social media, okay, and we move and we're scared to understand what's actually happening. I like this player, but social media doesn't. I think Jay, I, I think um, a player should be a top five pick, but social media thinks he should be in the 30s. Okay, great. What happens instinctively in organizations is they start to lower the player because they feel as though that they don't want to hold up to the social media pressure. It happens yeah. a lot in politics. Yeah. And so I think this is the perfect case study of that situation. And so – what do they tell you to do to avoid this bias? They say, you've got to refocus on your information. you got to come back and get more information. If you're going to let the Mel Kuypers and the Todd McShays and all these other guys that evaluate the Jeremiah's affect how you evaluate the player, then you should go back and get more information. It isn't what do they know that I don't know. It's what more do I need to know. And I think that's really what happens. I think that's a really good point to bring up with the draft because I feel like there's that fine line between wisdom of the crowd where the consensus tends to kind of figure things out versus groupthink. And that group thing ends up becoming, oh, like social media hates this player. Well, then I guess we need to lower this player down our board because, one, we don't want to have to answer for all the scrutiny of, like, why did you take this guy at, in the top five versus him being a rated 30th overall? And then also just kind of the general bias, I think, can seep into somebody's mind when they're looking for outside opinions. So I think that's a really good way to kind of describe the draft and what we're going to see play out over the next couple months. Uh, on the Carter point, though, you mentioned the overreaction to maybe some of the, the news that has come out here. And, and I don't want to say overreaction like it's not a big deal because obviously it is a very big deal two young people lost their lives on january 15th but without knowing all the information we saw the betting markets sort of react to this a lot of the first defensive player to be drafted markets were all taken down before then carter was the odds on favorite at minus 105 i believe will anderson was right behind him the alabama pass rusher then tyree wilson out of texas tech was behind both of those guys there I would imagine because those markets got taken down, I would imagine that Will Anderson now becomes the favorite, even though no team has come out and said that Carter is off our board or Carter's now been lowered because of some sort of off the field issues here. I think that this is something where I think people are maybe jumping uh, to conclusions 
that Carter is maybe being dropped down boards? Is that kind of how you read this thing out based yeah. on who you've talked to around the league? I think they definitely are. And I think this bias is part of it. I think it, it's really, it really becomes challenging. You know, like I give John Schneider at the Seattle Seahawks. He doesn't care about what other people yeah. say. He doesn't care about his grade. He just drafts good play. He drafts players, right? He's not going to care about who he should pick at six. You know, he's, he, he'll pick whatever quarterback he wants or whatever player he wants. So, I, but I think they're few and far between I think there is an impact and you like you said when you have group think I think when I think a group think I think a Ryan Pace in the room looking at everybody saying hey we like this guy everybody's on the same page they turn in the Trubisky card to me when you have that much of a consensus like in betting something's wrong you know it's the Walsh mm-hmm. line if we're all thinking alike no one's thinking so clearly you've yeah. got to try to do that and, and I think what they tell you and when you start startup companies uh it, it, the, the, this book, Amp It Up, it talks about when you start startups, they, they talk about how the reason startups really struggle is because there's a 50-50 split in decision making. OK, because you have to kind of form this consensus and it really it kind of hinders. There's no progress made. You got four founders and they all have they all have a say. So nobody. So you get nowhere. You get gridlock. And I think that happens in the draft room. I think because everybody's looking for collaboration that like a startup, they're not able to get this going. And I think this is kind of the betting market has to react to this because they don't have an information. That's what better yeah. the betting market's always concerned about not having the right information. That's why they wanted to hire the Woges and the Schefters. They want that information before anybody else gets it. But now that they don't, they're at a disadvantage. I think to me, teams should just take a step back, forget about this. I mean, I, I really believe it. You know, we use mock drafts in the NFL to gauge where a player might go. Like if you like a player, Say you like a player you think is going to go somewhere between 50 and 75. You gauge that, right? So you see, you go through all the mock drafts and you say, okay, this is his range. Just like you, they do with all the, the, the bracketology. How about that? We Now we have bracketology. Like that's some kind of science, right? We go through all that, right? <laughs> and then it comes up with the top 64 teams. Well, what, what happens is, which you don't realize, by doing that exercise, you really end up turning bias onto yourself. Because you end up saying, well, I don't really need to pick that guy there because he's going to go much later, when in reality, he might not. Yeah. I mean, that's we saw that play out last year at the, at the after the draft when Sean McVay was asked about Cole Strange and was like, oh, wow, they picked Cole Strange there because that's a guy that we had rated in the second or third round or whatever, and New England took him in the 30s uh, in the first round. So that's kind of how that can – you can get caught right. off guard if you're relying too heavily on some of those and mock traps. That's why, I, that's why I sent you the grading system so you can understand you know, the verbiage that has to be attached to the player because when you just mm-hmm. attach the grade to the player that where he's going to go, when you just make that prediction, then all of a sudden you just fall into a trap. If you were a general manager in the league right now and Carter's going to finish with his interviews the rest of the weekend, what would you ask him now that he's returned to Indianapolis to the combine to do the measurement stuff, do the interviews? What would you ask Jalen Carter in that 18 minutes that you have a chance to meet with him? Well, before I met with him, I would want to read what he said in the police report, which you can get. It's full. You know, that's out there. So you could get that. I would read that police report quickly. And then I would try to frame my questions around what's missing in the police report. Uh, you know, I would play Columbo here, uh, Jim Rockford, you know, and try to figure out what I'm missing and what I need to get to and then what I need to find out. And then really lead him into some questions that he has to give me some answers to that I have to follow back up on and go back to him again and try to get more. Because I would just tell him simply, this is just the beginning of our exercise on trying to learn more about you. We're gonna do more of this. And so just so you know, anything you say here, it, you're like in a really almost in a court of law because we're gonna keep it, we're gonna record it, and don't change your story. Mm-hmm. Don't change your story later, because that just makes everything worse. Yeah, it's really gonna be kind of a, a, a tricky situation for teams to kind of go through here because there was reports that Carter maybe because he left the scene reportedly after the crash on that January 15th night 
or early morning, I should say. And then there was also the discussion that he maybe he said different stories to the police after when he was questioned. So there, there's all sorts of kind of layers to this thing here. We obviously don't know everything with this story because how could yeah. we? The, even even the police report, I mean, even that, you kind of have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. I mean, everything is alleged. Everything is police say because it's their investigation and you can't jump to all the conclusions here. So teams are going to really have to kind of dig down deep and find out if this player is someone that they feel like is worthy of coming into their building in their facility. Because when you look at the tape, I mean, just to talk about Carter as the player, he looks awesome. <laughs> like He looks like a fantastic player. But if there's some other stuff added on here, it might cause for a little bit of a pause. Well, I think what you have to do is retrace steps, right? So was he drinking? See, because he wasn't involved or because allegedly he might have left the scene of the crime, he wasn't yep. his blood yep. alcohol wasn't tested. So mm -hmm. what you really need to do is find out where this party started, right? Where it started. It, was it at a bar? Was it at a, a fraternity house? Where was the party that started? And then you need to figure out and talk to people that were at that party. And then you need to be become detective and, and move forward. That's kind of how this thing's got to go. It can't go with what happened on that night. I mean, he wasn't tested, so you don't know if he was drinking or wasn't drinking. That's only he's going to tell you that. But what he tells you, you're going to be able to find out. Yeah, so the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and the final note on this before we take our first break, so the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in their article yesterday said that Carter was present at the scene of the crash, left the scene before officers arrived, and then gave, quote, shifting accounts of the wreck as an Athens police officer questioned him about whether he had been racing the car that crashed. So, yeah, w w if you leave and then you get questioned, maybe at that point, who knows when he was questioned about that stuff. It could have been the next morning or or, or what have you. But clearly, yeah. if you left, you left for a reason, I would I would guess. Uh, I mean, more than leaving for any reason, you have two of you have a teammate and, a, and the woman recruiting wor that works with you that are mm -hmm. in critical condition. I don't think they were, yeah. you know, they were pronounced dead on site. I mean, there's something to worry about. What can I do? I mean. If you've watched the Murdoch murder thing on on Netflix, I don't know if you've watched that, but where after that boating accident, the guy, the girl who got killed, Mallory Beach, her name was, you know, her boyfriend, Anthony, he stayed at the scene forever in hopes that they would eventually find her. I mean, he never vacated. I mean, it took him like maybe a day before he left. So like what what triggered him to leave? Like there's more to this story than meets the eye here. And maybe he would maybe they were taken to the hospital when he left. I don't know. You know, these are all speculative things that you have to really as an as an NFL director, you got to get to the answers of it. And you got it. And you can't allow somebody to do it. We when Lloyd Collins came out out of LSU, his girlfriend, like two days before the draft, his girlfriend got assassinated, got shot in, a, in mm -hmm. a, what was almost a drug related. I'm not sure what it was. But because he was the ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend of the girl, ex yep. he never he didn't get drafted. And, you know, and, and some and some of the security people that were doing the research, well, you can't draft them. Well, I'm like, OK, you can't draft them. Maybe that's true, but maybe it's not true. You know, Dallas and we tried to get him in New England for a visit because we felt like based on the information that I collected that he that he wasn't involved. And so we, but we, but Jerry, your boy, Jerry talked him off the, you know, like a cat off the top of a fish truck. He convinced him to stay. And, you know, we never had a chance, but to me, it's all about who can get the right information. Yeah. Well, they, they hosted him for that uh, offensive lineman dinner. And then the rest was history. Uh, yeah, as Ly Ly Lyle in. Collins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I make a call in. yeah. <laughs> There's that famous photo. I think Tony Romo was there because that's when he was the quarterback. Uh, but yeah, no, that's that's Lyle Collins that when he was coming out of LSU. That's something that definitely people. Uh, if you forgot, he was a first, second round kind of caliber guy. Then yeah. I think his agent his, didn't his agent tell teams that if you're not going to draft him in the first round, don't draft him at all. Wasn't yeah, that Charlie, the kind of the story there? To take him. He, Rick Smith was calling everybody in the seventh round, screaming, don't take him. And there's no bulldog like Rick Smith. I could tell you that. There's no bulldog. He was just, just you know, which was really a mistake because somebody should have taken him in the seventh and then just played it out. He had no options. He, his only option was screaming. You know, I'm going to go back. You know, I kid. You know, that was his only option. He didn't have any options, but you know, he convinced everybody not to do it because nobody had the information to do it. Like now, there's enough time to get information. If this would have happened yeah. two days before the draft, then then it's a serious situation. It's a, it's a serious situation. But B, it would have been harder to get information. 
Yeah, I think the final point on this is that because I think the question for a lot of folks is going to be, well, can he fall to my team and all that stuff? And I get that because everyone is interested to see what's going to happen in the draft. But we just don't know. I don't think there's a way to just confidently say either teams are okay or teams are going to take them off the board. We don't know. We'll have to see how things play out. But let's take our first break here on the GM Shuffle, and we'll talk about the NFLPA free agent report cards that came out yesterday on the other side. All right, Michael, I'm sure you saw this circulating yesterday on social media. The NFLPA, something they've never done before, put out this report card for teams giving it to pending free agents to help them kind of decide which franchise that they want to go to. And I thought it was really fascinating because they were judging the teams. They pulled 1,300 players, and they judged the teams on the following categories. Treatment of families, nutrition, weight room, strength staff, training room, training staff, locker room. And then I believe the final category that they judged them on was the travel. So those were the categories that these players got to rate. And when you looked at it and they added them all up at the end, the top teams, the top five teams in the NFL, according to the players, 1,300 of them, the Minnesota Vikings, number one, the Miami Dolphins, number two, Las Vegas Raiders, number three, Houston Texans, number four, Dallas Cowboys, number five. But the headliners was the bottom five teams in the NFL. I'll go in reverse order. So the Jaguars were number 28, the Chiefs, 29. The Chargers were 30, Cardinals 31, and then 32. Probably the least shocking thing about this was the Washington Commanders coming in last place. But uh, did you get a chance to read some of the snippets from from this report card? (laughs) I did. You know, the thing I thought was first – well, first of all, all the teams in the top are are, have fairly new facilities. Minnesota is a brand-new facility. The Raiders have a new facility. Miami's is brand new. So, you know, that's that 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 helps set the tempo a little bit there. And then the ones in the bottom, other than the Chiefs, they have kind of older facilities. I've been at the Arizona facility when we were at the Super Bowl. It's not really nice. And then I think to me, you know, because of the meals and because of all the things you provide for the players, I mean, when nutrition is so important, if you're not taking care of the players, I mean, I read the Cardinals are taking money out of the players' checks for food. Yeah. Like, I don't know how you do that. Like, I mean, who's the – was Kime saying that was okay? Like, I get the owners get all upset that they're paying for dinners, but at the end of the day – it's what we put in their bodies that count the most. It doesn't shock me that Washington was a disaster. I mean, he chimps on everything he can do. I mean, everything he tries to do. I mean, I read it. Did you read the Sally Jenkins column? I read that on the plane flying here to Salt Lake City. I mean, Park City, wherever the hell I am. Uh, and and he, he was selling peanuts. Think about this. He was selling peanuts at FedEx Stadium that were over that were expired. He was oh selling beer that was past God. due dates. I mean, think about that. Now, you think now that's why I cracked up when the punter said they have a great culture. I'm like anybody who says anything knows. I mean, they had no culture. I mean, it was a joke. You, you know, you didn't need to know any of the details, which are horrific, to know that that culture in Washington was horrible. And that facility is just, just hard. I was there when the punter got named general manager. And I like, oh, my God, this facility is like outdated 20 years ago. So. Look, it all comes back. I mean, you get what you put in, right? I mean, if you care about the players, you show them how you care. Like the Raider facility, I mean, Belichick, all he does every time he goes out there is talk about how great it is. You know, how beautiful it is, how it's laid out, how they've got – it's really all condensed into just the football operation. Sometimes when you get everybody involved, it spreads things out. So – You know, I I think it's important. I think that's a great report by the PA. I think it's really important. And I think it should serve as an awareness to these teams to like, look, you know, I know it's hard to the the money that we're spent. Like, can you imagine that we're doubling players up in rooms? I mean, like, you know, I mean, like, what are we doing? Like, Isn't sleep when we talk about sleep is the most important thing. We got some guy snoring and we can't sleep. Is it hard though, or does it just cost money? That's the thing. Like, I I feel like if you're going to own a professional sports franchise, you have to be willing. If you're serious about having a successful franchise, you have to be willing to put in, like you said, you get out of it what you put in. If you're not willing to put in the effort and the resources and the money and the time to make sure that these guys can perform at peak levels, what are you in it for? Other than to just collect money from, from, from revenue sharing. We're only competing against a team. So why do they do it, right? So every nickel they can save. Like when I worked at the Raiders, the carpet was disgusting. It was disgusting. Like, I, I, I mean, there could have been asbestos in that carpet. It was so bad, right? I mean, it was horrible. And it was pink. 
and it was blue. It had nothing to do with the rain. We would never replace the carpet. We Getting office supplies was like damn near impossible, right? You, you couldn't. And so why? Because every dollar that goes into those things comes out of the owner's bottom line, right? But it's okay to pay a player a lot of money because you've got to pay players money because that comes out of another pool. You follow me? So when you don't have meals for players, that those meals are coming out of out of the, the owner's pockets. It's his generosity. But you're in a business where you're competing against everybody. I mean, they you know San Francisco. There's I mean their their whole cafeteria is incredible. The food they get, the Jets, the same thing. Like all these teams have these incredible facilities with really great chefs that come in and prepare food. I mean, I said the Patriots, we're getting three meals a day every day. I mean, it was it was great. I mean, the facility wasn't great because it's in a stadium. You don't have any windows, but in terms of just the 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 giving to the players, it's awesome. So to put a bow on the Commanders, here's where how they graded out in each category: treatment of families was an F, food service slash nutrition D plus, weight room C plus, strength coaches hey A plus. So shout out to the strength coaches, training room F minus, training staff D. Locker room F minus, team travel F minus. That is yeah. atrocious. I mean, absolutely atrocious just, organization. Every corner. I mean, you know, and, and a little bit of it because he's got that empire. You know, he's Napoleon, right? So everything I'm sure he has to go through him. So he's the one who can, there's no budgets. Like, okay, you, here's your travel budget, right? Here's what we're going to do on travel. Or here's what we need on travel. Here's what we need on food. He's saying, okay, cut, 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 because it means more, more, more. Like, that's how it all works. Okay, what did we spend last year on travel? What's it going to cost us this year? You know, and so how can I save a dollar? I mean, it's really, that's what he's doing. And so, you know, and, and he's, look, that whole, if you read the Sally Jenkins column, I don't know when it was. I saw it on on, on the Washington Post today. But, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, it sums up. I mean, he clearly is one of those owners that he pretends he cares about winning, but he really doesn't. Now, it's not, not just Dan Snyder. There's other owners as well in the National Football League who we should bring up here because Cincinnati Bengals, successful team over the last couple of years, back-to-back AFC title trips. They went to the Super Bowl two years ago. Here's this from the families and the treatment of families column. Players report that there is nowhere safe and warm for mothers and children to go during the game and that breastfeeding mothers have sat on the public restroom floor to nurse their babies. Like there's no family room. There's nothing like, like, like come on, like that, that's basic. That's basic humanity. I feel like just like, hey, yeah. we know that you guys have some spouses if you do or whatever. Let's make sure that they're taken care of. So you don't have to worry about that. It's on the public restroom floor. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I, I think to me that that's one of those where if they bring it up, you know, they I think somebody's got to complain about it to make them aware. I'm not saying it's right. But usually mm-hmm. when you work for the Bengals, they take really good care of you. So that's kind of like somewhat surprising. But I mean, obviously, it's true if they complained about it. But somebody needs sometimes people aren't aware of it or somebody's not doing their job. And when you're in a new stadium like that, there should be somebody that has, hey, where are the family's going to sit? I mean, hey, a lot of teams don't give you club seats, Femi. I mean, you know, you work for a team, you know, and you don't get club seats. You get seats that are outside the club because, you know, the club seats are so expensive. You know, your company seats are, are nowhere near. Like when I worked at the Raiders, we had club seats in Oakland. You know, we didn't have to pay the P. You know, we got four tickets. They were good seats. They're right there on the 50. You see your family and all the families were together. But again, that comes out of the revenue. The Jacksonville Jaguars had this one. <laughs> Players reported that for three to four weeks. This past season, there was a rat infestation in the locker room and laundry hamper. <laughs> I mean, and we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in the land of COVID. Can you imagine this now? I mean, this is with COVID. Yeah, rats. I mean, talking about sanity. I mean, we're in Wuhan. I mean, geez, oh, man. Like, and that building is, you know, they're another team that's in a stadium, right? So when you're in those stadiums, you're trying to configure rooms based on the stadium instead of just going and get your own facility and doing it and just play. I think sometimes it hurts teams. I know in Carolina, one of the things they felt like that because they practiced and play in the stadium, near the stadium, there's no real, that like there's no, okay, that special moment we're going to the stadium. You know, like there's no special moment. And I think that does affect you. And I think sometimes, you know, you got to get away from it. Yeah, it all starts to feel the same. Uh, so I'm glad that this stuff is out there because – 
some of the things that you're reading, this sounds just wild that NFL owners would allow this to happen. Or maybe, like you said, they weren't aware of it. But at least now they're aware of it. Hopefully they can get yeah. it corrected to where we no longer have rats. We no longer have mothers say, uh, nursing we'll on the ground of a public restroom. I will say this. All those things are important. But if the Bengals offer a million dollars more than the Chiefs – than the uh, the Texans offer or – the the Raiders offer they're going to get the player. Yeah, money it's talks. Kind of money talks. <laughs> money definitely talks. Speaking of free agents, Derek Carr, free agent quarterback. He's a veteran that's out there. Has played a number of games, so teams obviously interested as a starter for this upcoming season. Carr is in Indianapolis. So it's not just his agent. He himself physically is in Indianapolis to meet with teams at the Combine. He's going to meet with the Jets, Panthers, and Saints. I believe some of these meetings have already happened. I know some others. I think Carolina, that one's going to be a little bit later on Monday, I think is what I read. I might be wrong there. But he's in the process of meeting with those three teams, Jets, Panthers, and the Saints at the Combine. Correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. I don't really remember free agent players going to the combine to meet with executives and coaches. It's usually that their agents are there doing the kind of the power brokering and all the deals and all that stuff. Do you have any recollection of players actually physically going to Indianapolis to meet with these well, teams? First of all, he's a free agent. So he's not a, he's not a restricted free agent or an unrestricted free agent. That's so true, he, yeah. So he can't he can be there because he's an on the street free agent. Now, what I didn't realize was and I, and I is usually when you're an on the street free agent, you can only meet with the team at their facility or they can meet with you at your home. One of those two. But obviously that's gotten waived so he could come in there and he can kind of position himself and be in front of everybody and talk to everybody. And like, hey, look, it's pr pretty smart for him to be there. So instead of having flights all over the country. You know, he can just do one flight to Indianapolis, sit down and meet with all these teams and go through it, and they can meet with him. I mean, look, if somebody was going to take over his contract, he would be already on a team. Like, they're yeah. trying to create this illusion of there's competition. And the one thing about Carr, when you play 142 games and you play that much, there's a lot of coaches, okay, that he has played for, all right? So Gruden's cell phone has rung, you know. Greg Olson's cell phone, all these guys that have coached him have been called to be like, what's the deal, right? So like, don't think that that's not going on behind the scenes. Like this isn't, okay, I'm here. Like they're, the league is a little bit of, even though everybody competes with one another, they still call the other team to ask them what they think of the kid. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of really players into this, too, is so Carr's going to I mean, he's played for so many different people that, you know, those phone calls are going to determine where he goes salary wise too, based on what they're hearing from those teams that have coached them, those coaches that have coached them. So I think it's a smart play for him. I just don't think he's got that market of thirty five. I mean, he's trying to drum it up and he's got yeah. good PR behind him. You know, he's got good PR and I hope he gets whatever he can get. But I think to me, if you're a strategist and you're a team, you're saying to yourself, who am I competing against for him? Like, why do I have to pay 35 million? Why don't I have to pay 25? I was talking with our producer, Elliot, beforehand, before we started recording this podcast. I was it almost to me feels like Carr is weirdly admitting that the market interest isn't there, or at least they're not hearing what they want to hear when they go on these individual visits. So, like you said, this is him <laughs> trying to drum up that interest. And almost say, all right, Jets, if you're interested, well, so are the Panthers and the Saints. Or yeah. Saints, if you're interested, so are the Jets and the Panthers. This, to me, feels like it's a, an active decision by Carr to say, let's try to drum up some interest and meet with these teams while they're all in Indianapolis. Because if he was the Pied Piper and was just the guy that everybody wanted, he could just take the visits and sit back and say, all right, well, I'll let my agent do the talking and, and we'll just go on the visit and I'll select the team like, like how Tom Brady did it when he was a free agent or like how we've seen in other sports where guys host these meetings and stuff but actively going to the combine to me it almost feels like he's admitting that he doesn't have as much leverage as he thinks right so like if he was really a hot if he was being hotly touted financially because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of teams that want him this is really more about what do we have to pay him than do we want him. yeah so i think to me if he were he would say look unless it's he would have been traded 
he would have picked the team and he would because the Raiders weren't going to hold him up for anything more than a, a Saturday pick. So he would have got traded. The team would have redone the contract. Nobody wanted the contract. See, everybody takes it in the media as nobody the the Raiders, you know, no, no, nobody wanted uh, the Raiders couldn't make a trade. No, mm-hmm. nobody wanted the contract. Right. That doesn't mean they yeah. don't want car. They didn't want the contract. When you make a trade for a player, you're trading for the contract and the player. If those two things don't meet, you got problems, right? That's why you become yeah. a cap casualty. You know, that's why you're on the street. So I think to me, that's kind of where where that is. And and I think when you look at that, I think he's there and he's trying to create that illusion of competition. And the Jets are in a holding pattern. I mean, this the, nobody knows. I mean, if you're Chris, Chris Ballard, do you take Carr today, or do you wait and see C.J. South throw, or do you wait and see Bryce Young? You know, like why would you do that? You got the fourth pick in the draft. I'm not ready to sign Carr yet. I got to know who I'm comp- who I'm comparing Carr to, right? It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. I love how I love how your boy Ryan Poles comes out and says, "Well, we're going to evaluate every quarterback, but we Fields is going to be our guy." Okay, I get that. But, Ryan, you realize that, you know, like I said on the last pod, your team point differential was 8.1. The Colts threw it 35 times a game. You had the 8.1 differential. You threw it 22 times a game. Now, explain to me why you only threw it 13 less times when you were behind as much as anybody. Because you can't throw it. That's why. So don't tell me you're not looking at quarterbacks. Now, I'm not saying he's not going to keep fields, but don't tell me you're not looking at quarterbacks. Like, at some point, you got to come back with the facts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess Brian Poles is saying, "Hey, no stone unturned." But it is interesting the fact that they're uh, aggressively looking right. as as same aggressive thing. as they have been. Doing, I mean, it's the same thing Ballard's doing. He's looking at the. I mean, nobody's ready to move on Carr because they don't know what they're dealing with in the other thing. I can't. I, do I sign Carr for twenty five million? I mean, Garoppolo. You know, I think Garoppolo's market's going to be less than twenty million because I think Garoppolo's out wow. there. Nobody wow. knows what to do, and I think Garoppolo might have two or three two teams after him. And, you know, he may have to do a short, shorter deal. I think to me, this market is like, if I'm going to pay for somebody for the short term, do I pay like that? Be interested to see what, 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 this, what decisions come out. And, you know, we'll talk about this later. But when the Rogers white smoke blows up. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's a whole nother story. Uh, Frank Reich, though, new head coach of the Carolina Panthers. He did say that Carr, quote, checks a lot of boxes. So yeah, whatever does. that's worth. Maybe, I mean, maybe the Panthers end up becoming the front runner. Look, look, you don't throw for as many yards as he's thrown for. You don't check as a lot of boxes. Carr's got talent. There's no denying that. Carr's got talent. The car, you got to be able. Can Carr withstand getting hit early in the game? How he handles pressure? Can he make plays when the play breaks down? You know, this is just who Carr is. It isn't Carr's. A, you know, this isn't a black and white thing. Carr sucks, right? There's Carr's good yeah. player, but there's things that Carr doesn't do well. So how do we supplement that? How do we handle that? Yeah. Nuance to the discussion like it as often is in the NFL. Michael, let's take another break on the other side. Let's talk about my team. Everybody sees the blanket, the YouTube viewers. They see the Cowboys blanket behind us. Mike McCarthy had some interesting comments to say about how he will be different from the previous play caller, Kellen Moore. This is the GM Shuffle. All right, let's talk about him. America's team and the head coach, Mike McCarthy, spoke with the media during this combine this week and talked about taking over the play calling duties and how will be a little bit different than Kellen Moore, who is the coordinator for the last three, four years. Here's what he said, Michael. He said, quote, Kellen wants to light up the scoreboard, but I want to run the damn ball so I can rest my defense. I don't desire to be the number one offense in the league. I want to be the number one team in the league with the number of wins and a championship. This is something that we've discussed quite a bit on the GM shuffle podcast throughout the whole season. And I think this is McCarthy echoing what you've talked about in terms of the video game calling versus call the game to win. Right. And I think he just said it wrong because I see Warren Sharp. Uh, somebody sent me Warren Sharp's tweet today. Oh, about yeah, how, that's, that's a good one. You know, and that he ripped him because he doesn't understand you have to throw the ball. I mean, I get, you know, Warren's an analytical guy and he does what he does. But, you know, Warren's never really put together a game plan or managed a game on any level at all in terms of, of understanding how to complement offense, defense, and the kicking game. And I think that's – McCarthy said it the wrong way. Like, I would have said it this way. Look, I, I think we need to have a more balanced attack. We need to pace the game better. We need to control the pace of the game, and we need to be able to play less defense. And so we can't just constantly worry about having to throw the football 
to score. We've got to be able to pace the game and slow the game down to rest ourselves. That's really all we're talking about. And every week will be different. There will be some weeks where we need to throw it 50 times. There'll be some weeks where we're going to need to throw it all the time. There'll be some weeks we can't rest our defense. But when we get into a game where we have to be able to pace the game, then we've got to be able to have a balanced attack, run and pass. And I think, to me, if you look at the numbers, they ran the ball fairly well. To me, it wasn't that they didn't run the ball. It was how they chose to manage the game during the game. See, people think game management is about during the game, you know, and it's not. It starts with Monday, how we want to play the game, how we're going to manage this game, what are we going to call in situations. Go to the third and first and ten at the eighteen. You got the punter there. The guy's going to fucking put you, pin you back inside the 20. So you got to get a first down there. Like if you, if I were the play caller on that drive, I would have come out with a, a guaranteed four yard gain. I don't know what it would have been. It would have been something where I'm going to have second and six. Then I'm going to try, maybe I run the ball there again, right? Maybe I run it there and I get to third and four because I'm going for it on fourth down because I'm not letting the punter pin me in the 18 with no timeout. I'm just not punting. But I got to get plays. I think that's what McCarthy was talking about. Like, run the damn ball. Like, this isn't Bo Schembechler run the ball. This is pace the game. You know, I can hear Belichick on the headset. Stick a run in there, Josh. Okay, why? Because he wants to run the to pace the game. Slow the game down. You know, make the clock work for you. I think that's what Mike's talking about. I don't think he was talking the way Sharp interpreted him. Yeah, I think a lot of people kind of jump to conclusion because they, they see run the ball and then everybody obviously gets triggered about, oh, they just want to be archaic and run the football and like do the whole Schembechler thing and all that. But I, I think that people kind of jump to conclusions. You mentioned the second to last drive in that game. I think the biggest turning point in that game, honestly, was when Dallas was up 6-3 and there was what, just before the two, just after the two-minute warning, yeah. when before did, Dak yeah. Prescott threw that interception, they had a chance to control the game and at worst case scenario, go up 9-3 to at the half, maybe even go up and, and be up 13-3. to at, or, I'm sorry, rather be up 9-6 uh, to or 13-6 to at, at halftime. Like that, that was their chance to kind of grab control of the game. Prescott throws the pick, the Niners go down the field, they kick the field goal, and all of a sudden Dallas is down 9-6. And I think the part of the quote, though, that that was most interesting from McCarthy, he said, I think when you're an offensive coordinator, you're in charge of the offense. But being a head coach and being a play caller, you're a little more in tune with everything. And that's what he's talking about, like what you've been discussing of how to call the game to win it and how to manage the game within the play calling. It's knowing the seeing the full picture. Because it's almost like where Kellen Moore was he was too close to the trees that he couldn't see the forest type of thing. You gotta see the entire picture and not just, hey, let's put up points, let's put up points, let's put up points, which is good. You need points to win, but you also need some other things to win as well. You know, but I think too, what I think Mike should say, he should have done a better job of curtaining McCar- uh, containing the joystick like he should have said hey we need to do this but he you know he's still the head coach but he didn't he kind of let joystick have enough rope look i've said this all the time the offense coordinator's job is to get first downs and score points that's his job and unless the head coach brings them in they're just going to keep doing that like their job isn't to manage the game their job isn't yeah. to control pace of the game their job is to get first downs and do that so where, where mike sh- deserves some blame here is mike why didn't you do that when you had the chance unless jerry said hands off on i want more to run the offense leave him alone okay great then if that's happened okay but as a head coach you've got to be in there it's really about what strategy are we using this week for the game that's critical yeah, no, I think that's a fair criticism of McCarthy that he didn't step in. And especially when the, you're the head guy, the, the criticism is going to come on you. So yeah, you got to I mean, make sure that if you want him to throw like, look, run, I mean, you know, throw it, don't, don't run it there. You know, don't throw it there. Run it there. You know, like, hey, hey, Kellen, run it here. You know, get out of your basement here. I need you to run it. You know, I'm running ball here. Like, you know, seriously. Like, let's dial yeah. up one of those Madden runs you got over there. Like, ser- that's all you got to do. Like, that's when you're in tune to the game. I, I You can't expect more to be able to do that. And he won't do that in San- – he won't do that in the Los Angeles Charlie. He'll just keep doing it. That You know, he'll just keep throwing it. Now, why- Lombardi gets fired because he threw it too much because they couldn't run the ball. You know, after they after they started the second half when they were ahead of Jacksonville, they ran for minus four yards. And the next nine plays were run were throws because he's got to try to find a way to move the ball and move the clock. That's that's to me is on the head coach. That's more about strategy, right? We get so caught up in strategy over execution, right? So if you can't execute, where's your strategy? 
Like strategy, strategy only comes after execution. That's why all these guys with these huge playlists, they sit there and they look at them, but they can't execute them all good. It's the back to the diner. They can't cook it all good. So you got, you got really great strategy, but you can't execute it. Like we want to be a tempo team. Well, that's a great strategy, but you can't execute it because your defense sucks. Yeah, no, that's definitely a fair point. McCarthy, now the, the chips are in the center of the table. He's the play caller. He's the head coach. Nobody to point the finger to. Nobody to blame. It's going to come down to what he decides to do on offense in 2023. A couple of quick notes here before we get out of here. Bill's defensive coordinator, Leslie Frazier, taking the year off from coaching. Plans to return in 2024 here. But I think that's a big blow to Buffalo because Leslie Frazier, one of the better defensive coordinators I think we've had uh, in, the, in the game of football. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I must, be, I don't, I've never seen this before in my career in the league where a guy takes a sabbatical for a year. You know, I mm-hmm. hope everything's okay in his life, and I hope his health is fine, and you know, and I hope that that he can come back. You know, I'm sure that Sean McDermott, you know, it's he's going to run the defense or find somebody who's going to run it in the same vein. But you just hope his health is fine. That's the most concerning. When I read that, I was like, oh, I hope he's okay, because I was yeah. concerned about that. I mean, to me. You know, it's one thing to take it, this. The NFL, it's a little bit like, you know, what they said in the, you know, it's like uh, you haven't gotten to this season of the Sopranos, but this one guy. What season is it? I think this is in season five. So, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I haven't got there yet. One of the guys, no, we haven't got through season two. I'm going to bring Corey on to have to replace it to, so we can have Sopranos talk. But there's one. I started season two last night, man. Okay. Here, first of all, not to get us off track. But now here's the new dilemma. So I was watching season one to rewatch it, get back into a flow of things a couple days ago. My lovely fiance, Liz, she comes in and she starts watching it as well. Now she's hooked. And now it's become a thing to where it's like we have to watch it together, not just me binging it alone. So now I got to wait for her to get off of work. So it's you can you you can watch it and rewatch it. But anyway, so I think it's season five. This guy wins a bunch of inheritance money from his aunt and he wants to move to Florida and he wants to retire. And, and, and he keep, he's given Tony gold watches. He's given Tony's gift to let him to, to have the permission to retire. And he's a kid's, an, a kid's a druggie. His family's all screwed up, you know. And the next thing, and, and, and Tony and Syl finally says to him, you know, this, this isn't like any business. You can't retire in this business. Like, there's no retirement in, in this thing we're in, this thing of ours. So I always felt like the NFL, they, they force you out. Or if you're lucky to go out in a in, in a nice, but it's hard to retire. So I, I just hope it's not a health issue for Leslie. Same here. Hopefully he is doing a OK, but he's plans to return back in 2024. Uh, good vibes towards Leslie Frazier. Final note, we've seen two teams use the franchise tag, at least not a, not officially on the Jacksonville end, but officially on the Washington Commanders end. Deron Payne has been tagged by the Commanders and then Jaguars. The report came out that they are expected to tag Evan Ingram, their tight end. So the franchise tag numbers for a tight end, 11.345 million for a defensive tackle. It's 18.9 million. So just under 19 million there. Uh, I guess no real surprises with those guys kind of kicking off this franchise tag window. No, I mean, look, it's cheap because Ingram, he should be listed as a receiver, not a tight end. He getting screwed here. His agent was looking for receiver money. And he's tagged a tight end, and that's why it's easy. Look, Jacksonville is about nine or ten guys they can redo to get below the cap. So they're pretty easy. You know, Washington will redo a couple deals, but, you know, they got rid of Carson Wentz. I have the numbers. I mean, when you finally total up what was paid to Wentz and what what people gave to get Wentz, it could go down as the greatest. He could go down as the most – how do I want to put this? The most – costly player in the history of the nfl from wow. from, from the rent from the eagle trade mm-hmm. to then the to then the colt trade to then the washington trade and then the money i mean it's remarkable it really is remarkable what he was able to get. Uh, Kenny Galladay as well. I believe he was released for the Giants. Kenny Galladay is I've, I've already inducted him into the ski mask Hall of Fame. Uh, and what he did. <laughs> he's right next to Brock Osweiler. Brock Osweiler will take him in and say, man, we got a heist. Can we do one more heist together? So perfect. I mean, <laughs> I forgot about Osweiler. Don't blame, don't blame Galladay. The Giants are the one who gave no, I don't. Who were they competing I, God, who are they competing? That's the fundamental question you have to ask in free agency. Who are we competing against? Like, who's our competition? I know we got to get out of here. So, all right, get back on that Sopranos. 
I, I will get back on it. We're going to continue season two tonight. But God bless all these guys that get all their money. Kenny Galladay, uh, Brock Osweiler, Carson Wentz. I don't hate the player. I think the game is a little bit funny. That's all I'll say, though. So Ski Mask Hall of Fame. Hell, I wish to be a Ski Mask Hall of Famer and go live on a private island for the rest of my life. Uh, speaking of which, Michael, well, what are you doing down there in, in Park City? you going to I Sundance? Or what's what's going what? on? You're, you're skiing? I wish I was at Sundance. Yeah, me and Robert Redford and Millie and I, we're all going to go out to dinner tonight. Uh, let's see. I got a, I got a, uh, a talk to Raymond James, yeah, a talk okay. on my book. So I got to do that here. So I'm on. I took vacation from Veasan to come out, but Alia doesn't allow me vacation on the GM Shuffle. So this is really my vacation time that I'm using. But uh, anyway, so I'm out here, and it's beautiful. Park City is absolutely gorgeous at the St. Regis Hotel. It's magnificent. It's it's really beautiful. And I, all the all the guys from Raymond James have been so good to me. Uh, and one of the guys is a huge uh, JFK assassination buff, although he thinks that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. By the end of this trip, I'll have him convinced the other way. <laughs> have a hell of a time while you're out there you. in Salt Lake City. Uh, and we will be back on Monday with the podcast. Thank you once again to our producer, Elliot Bowman. Thank you to DraftKings. Thank you to Visa. And subscribe, rate, and review you wherever you get your podcast. And we'll see you guys on Monday. Talk to you later, Michael. Thanks, Femi. Thanks for watching the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. And for more videos like this, make sure to subscribe to VSIN Live and the GM Shuffle podcast with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN, wherever you get your podcasts.